Okay, let's talk fish. Um, I think this is probably going to be a... I think I'm going to probably have to do this in two videos, otherwise it'll just go on and on forever. So, <clears throat> what are we talking about? We are talking about bony fish, which are things like, you know, goldfish and trout and all the things you think of as being fish. Uh, but also what we call the cartilaginous fish, things like sharks and mantas and rays um, that don't have a bony skeleton, they have a skeleton made out of cartilage. And there are slight differences that you need to know between the two things. But basically, uh, in both of these organisms, the gas exchange surface are the gills. Now you can see that in the uh, bony fish, it's kind of behind that sort of cheek plate, uh, which uh, it just looks like a cheek plate, and it's called an operculum, uh, it covers over the gills. It's a movable flap, so it moves in and out, you probably can't, it's probably going blurry now, but anyway. And, and behind each operculum, we have four what are called gill arches. They're supporting the fish gill, and you'll have seen those in the dissection. And on each gill arch, there's a double row of gill filaments. And <coughs> uh, they can vary in number, so the more gill filaments you've got, the more surface area you've got, the more gas exchange you can do. Um, in sharks, they're behind uh, what are called gill slits. So same arrangement, so you've got still gill arches with these very feathery gill filaments attached to them. So when we're looking at sort of how we're fulfilling these, um, and you can ignore the rest of the diagrams for now, let's just look at how they're fulfilling those sort of structural requirements. So we're looking at the gas exchange surface. being the gill filaments. Now some places you might read also that that's the gill plates and we'll talk about gill plates in a minute. So we have a large surface area because we've got many of them. So, let's talk about gill plates then. Um, so, if we looked at, I'm just going to take my shark and my fish away for a minute. If we look at a gill filament, and um, we draw a little sort of diagram of a gill filament. The gill filaments stick out from the gill arch like that. And every so often, along each gill filament, there are little raised sort of D-shapes. Called gill plates. Now obviously if you've got lots of those on the top of each filament then you're going to get an increased surface area again. The thing about the gill plates is that this is where the capillary supply is. So through the gill plates you've got um, a capillary network. So you've got blood vessels larger blood vessels, artery, arter, arterioles and venules coming through there and this is then sort of branching out into a massive capillary network and draining back in. So you've got branchy, 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 lots of capillaries. So in addition they have a good supply of capillaries to the surface of the gill plates. So again, in the dissection you will have noticed, or you will notice, that the, the gills in a fresh fish are pretty much very bright red. <coughs> and remember the function of our capillaries are your gas exchange surface, 
you've got your capillary with blood flowing through it so that what's happening is that it is delivering carbon dioxide constantly at a high concentration to be diffused out and it's constantly gaining oxygen but then removing it so it's delivering removing so that's the point of capillaries so they help to um, maintain a concentration gradient and pretty much my the, in the next video is probably well, it might even be the one after that is going to be on mechanisms for maintaining concentration gradients using the idea of circulation so because the um, capillaries are close to the surface we also have a short diffusion path so that's of course from water to blood and of course the capillaries and, and the gill plates are permeable the gases that they're diffusing. So um, the reason that uh, oxygen is so difficult to get out of water, one of the problems of living in water, and this applies to really all aquatic animals, our aquatic habitat has a much lower oxygen concentration than air. So air has got 21% of oxygen in it. Doesn't matter whether you're up a mountain, whatever, still 21% of the gases in the air are oxygen. Um, it's further sort of there's further difficulties in that um, uh, deeper water has even less oxygen in it. Uh, warmer water has less oxygen uh, because it's got reduced uh, solubility in warmer water and still water has less oxygen in it so if you're a sort of, you know, a deep lake fish uh, living in the tropics with, uh, you know, and you're in still water, you, really you've got hardly any oxygen to go out. So you just need to be aware of that. So things that will increase the oxygen uh, constantly, the amount of oxygen in the water, things like uh, turbulence. So things like, you know, fast flowing streams, fast flowing water, water tumbling over little rocks that all going over a weir, going over a waterfall, that's all going to sort of oxygenate the water. So they're the problems. And the other thing about um, living in water is that water is a dense respiratory medium. Now what I mean by that is that the respiratory medium is where you're getting your oxygen from. And that makes it hard to move uh, over, over the gas exchange surface. So there's some of the difficulties that these fish are facing. So if you're breathing in air, that's pretty straightforward. It's pretty not very dense at all, and you just use a bit of muscle contraction to move it. But water's far harder to move around, which is why you do sort of resistance training in water. So. We've got the features of the gas exchange surface, we've got what the difficulties are and we're going to look in the next video at how we move that over the gas exchange surface and how we maintain the concentration gradient across the gas exchange surface.